welcome to Dove Biology Apes Lessons to Go. In this video, we'll be exploring evolution and biodiversity. Biodiversity is probably one of our very most important renewable resources. Biodiversity can be defined as the different life forms and life sustaining processes they perform. Biodiversity actually has four major components. The most obvious of those would be species diversity which is the number of species present in different habitats. But even amongst that species, there's going to be genetic diversity, or the variety of genetic material that's going to be found within that population. It is that genetic material which allows for resilience in that population, as genetic changes may allow for that population to change and survive in an ever-changing world. The storehouse for all of that genetic and species diversity is the ecological diversity. All of the various terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems that are found on Earth. And finally, there's functional diversity, which is the biological and chemical processes like photosynthesis, which assists with the flow of energy in, a, in an ecosystem, or the decomposers and their ability to recycle matter. Each of these uh, pieces of functional diversity are needed for the survival of individual species and the support of whole ecosystems. So beyond that, why should we care about biodiversity? Well, biodiversity is an essential component of our natural capital. It provides us with many natural resources like food, fuel, and medicine. Natural services like the ability to purify our air and water, increase our soil fertility, remove unwanted pests, and dispose of our waste. And then finally, biodiversity is, has the ability to ha have a certain aesthetic pleasure. They say that variety is the spice of life. Well, imagine a world without the orangutan or a panda bear. Um, it's just something to enjoy knowing that there's such diversity on planet Earth. When we look, though, at fossil records, we find that there are certain organisms that are no longer present today that were present in the past. This demonstrates that biodiversity has changed from the past to the present. So how might this have taken place? So what may explain how life has changed over time? Well, according to scientific evidence, the major force of adaptation to changes in environmental conditions is biological evolution. Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace proposed the concept of natural selection as the mechanism for biological evolution. They observed that in populations there is a struggle for existence. More individuals are born than can survive. But within that struggle, there are certain individuals that possess characteristics or traits which allow them to survive better than others. As a result, they're able to reproduce and pass that trait down to the next generation. This differential survival in the face of competition and predation is known as natural selection. Biological evolution by natural selection involves the change in a population's genetic makeup through successive generations. Evolution only works on populations, not individuals. Now, there are three conditions necessary for biological evolution by natural selection. The first is genetic variation. Within a population, there must be varieties. Those varieties must be based upon uh, characteristics embedded in their traits, which can be passed from parent to offspring. And finally, some of those variations must be favorable that trait must lead to differential reproduction or survival of the fittest. Let's take a look at an example so we can see how natural selection could be at work in a population. Here we have a population of insects in which there's variation. There's variation in their genes which allows them to be either protected uh, or not protected against a active ingredient of an insecticide. When the insecticide is applied, there's going to be differential survival. Only those which have that favorable characteristic are able, able to survive. If they're able to find a mate who also survived, that trait then can be passed down to the next generation. So additional applications of that same insecticide will not be effective, and so that population of resistant insects will grow. There will be a survival of the fittest, which in this case is something that we would like to avoid.
A population may evolve as a result of small changes that occur in its gene pool. This is known as microevolution. The gene pool consists of all of the alleles, all of the copies of genes in all of the individuals making up a population. The gene pool acts as a reservoir from which the next generation will draw its genes. One way that a gene pool can change is a result of mutations. Mutations are random changes in the genetic structure or number of DNA molecules in a cell that can be inherited by offspring. Mutations can occur in any cell, but only those taking place in reproductive cells are passed to offspring. Sometimes a mutation can result in a new genetic trait that gives an individual and its offspring a better chance for survival and reproduction. As a result, many scientists believe that mutations are the ultimate source of genetic variation in a population. Another way that a gene pool may change is a result of natural selection. When some individuals of a population have genetically based traits that cause them to survive and produce more offspring than others, the gene pool may change. We see three basic patterns of selection when it comes to changes in gene pools in a population. One example would be stabilizing selection. Here, those individuals that express the average physical appearance, the average phenotype, are favored. As a result, those genes that give them that particular average characteristic will also be favored and will be passed on to the next generation. The next pattern we may see would be directional selection, in which one of the two extreme phenotypes are favored. As a result, those genes would be passed on to the next generation. Lastly, we may see diversifying selection, in which both of the extreme phenotypes would be favored such that uh, those genes will be passed to the next generation while those of the average phenotype would be selected against and be reduced in number. Another way that gene pools can change is gene flow. When members of a population leave an area and new members enter, the natural genetic makeup of a population changes. When members of a population leave, this is called emigration. When they leave, they're going to take their genes with them. This is going to reduce the overall genetic diversity of a population. When new members of a population enter into a group, this is called immigration. New members coming in is going to increase the genetic variation in a population. The last way that a gene pool may change is through genetic drift. Genetic drift occurs when the gene pool of a small population changes as a result of chance, not due, not due to specific selection. For example, if we have a small population of insects, in which some of them are accidentally squished by someone coming through, those individuals did not get removed from the population as a result of poor fitness, it was just by chance. Now there are two situations that can actually shrink a population down to a small enough size in which genetic drift will have a greater impact. The first would be the bottleneck effect. Here disasters such as earthquakes, floods, and droughts, or um, overhunting may reduce the size of a population such that the surviving population's genetic makeup is much different than the original. Any small random changes that take place in that population's gene pool is going to have significant impacts on its overall diversity. The second situation that can shrink populations down to a size where genetic drift may have a greater impact is the founder effect. The founder effect occurs when there's a few individuals that colonize a new habitat. This new colony has a genetic makeup that is smaller and much more different in composition than the original population. Any small random changes that take place in this new population is going to be significant. There are many limitations to evolution by natural selection. A population's ability to adapt to new environmental conditions through natural selection will be limited by gene pool and how fast it can reproduce. If a trait isn't part of the gene pool, it's likely it will never show up in future generations.
Populations of diverse species that reproduce quickly, like weeds or bacteria, oftentimes will adapt to environmental conditions that change more quickly than species that reproduce more slowly and produce fewer offspring, like humans and elephants. Now, there are several common myths about evolution through natural selection that we need to clear up. The first of those is that survival of the fittest is not survival of the strongest. For biologists, fitness is a measure of reproductive success, not strength. Thus, the fittest individuals are those that leave the most descendants. A second common myth is that organisms don't develop traits because they need them. They develop those traits because some ancestor in the past had a gene that offered fitness over others that allowed for that individual to survive and pass that trait on to the next generation. Lastly, there is no such thing as genetic perfection. There's been no plan or goal of genetic perfection that's ever been identified. In terms of evolutionary process, it seems to be a random branching process that results in a variety of new species. The biodiversity that exists on planet Earth today is the result of millions of years of evolution by natural selection. The biodiversity found in the genes, species, ecosystem, and ecosystem processes are vital to sustaining life on Earth.